A few months ago, I uploaded a video that showed my first foray into the world of radio astronomy. Now it's time for a deeper dive. The project I did a few months ago was relatively simple. It allowed us to detect whether radio waves were coming from an object. It could pick up any object that emitted radio waves. Our primary target was the sun, but it would also pick up radio waves from trees, buildings, or people. Anything that emits radio waves. It did not, however, show us any information about that signal. We couldn't detect the amplitude. We couldn't break it down into individual frequencies. We couldn't tell how wide the bandwidth was that it was emitting. All that we could tell was that it was a radio source or wasn't a radio source. If we want to gather more information, we need a bigger and more complex telescope. And that is what you see here. This is a pyramidal horn antenna, a type of antenna that was used quite frequently in early exploration of the radio spectrum coming from outer space. For example, a horn antenna is what Harold Ewan and Edward Purcell used to discover radio waves coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy in 1951. Here you can see pictures of their horn antenna, which was mounted to the top of their science lab at Harvard University. Pyramidal horn antennas are used less frequently in radio astronomy today, mostly because they've been supplanted by the larger parabolic dishes. But they are still quite sufficient for what we want to do here. They make an excellent second step into radio astronomy. The horn antenna comprises two main components. The first is the pyramid itself, whose job is to change the impedance from that of open air to that of the waveguide, so that as little of the signal as possible is lost. The second component of the horn antenna is the waveguide, the rectangular box that is attached to the small end of the horn. The dimensions of the waveguide are optimized to the frequency that you hope to receive so that that frequency is picked up most efficiently. The waveguide confines the wave, allowing it to be picked up by a copper probe at the end of the waveguide. This copper probe then transmits the signal to the receiver. The telescope stand has a protractor for setting the elevation and a compass for setting the azimuth. Both are attached to the stand by 3D printed holders. Once the copper probe has picked up the signal, it feeds it to a low noise amplifier that also includes a bandpass filter. This increases the strength of the signal without passing on any frequencies that are outside of the range we are trying to capture. From there, the signal is fed into a software-defined radio dongle, which converts the radio feed into a format that a computer's sound card can understand. You can use any computer to analyze the signal as long as it has a sound card. I've chosen a Raspberry Pi 4 with a touch screen. This allows me to use a Linux operating system, which is a great environment for working with scientific programs. It's powered by a battery, so I can operate the system away from any major sources of radio interference. One of the best parts of this project is the fact that you can make this radio telescope yourself. Not only do you get the fun of making the antenna, but you also get to learn a lot about antennas and radio wave propagation as you go. You don't even need a fancy workshop in which to build it. I constructed this entire telescope in my apartment out of materials that I had purchased at my local home improvement store. After studying plans for the antenna online, I drew up the dimensions for my antenna. I then began cutting the materials for the telescope. The sides were cut from aluminum sheet metal and the waveguide was cut from aluminum flashing. L brackets were added to the side for additional stability and the parts for the pyramid were then assembled using pop rivets. The next step was to purchase a low noise amplifier and a SDR dongle. 
These two combined serve as the receiver for the telescope. I also purchased a set of connectors to tie the system together. The copper probe was soldered into one of the connectors, which was then attached to the waveguide. Finally, I built a mount to hold the telescope while it was in operation. I chose to make my telescope out of aluminum for durability, but I've also seen models of this antenna created using insulation board covered with aluminum foil. And for simplicity, some people use a standard paint thinner can for the waveguide. So, what type of signals are we hoping to pick up with our new radio telescope? What are the frequencies that are available to us, and what objects can we see in those frequencies? To answer that question, we need to take a look at the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen is the simplest of all atoms, and it accounts for 90% of all atoms in the universe. It consists of a single proton in the nucleus, represented here by the red sphere, and one electron, represented by the blue sphere. As subatomic particles, both the proton and electron have a property called spin, here represented by the arrows. They aren't actually spinning. Instead, spin is a type of inherent angular momentum that subatomic particles possess. When we measure the spin of a proton or electron in a hydrogen atom, the particle is always in one of two states. It's either down or up. These are the only two values the spin can have. This means that for neutral hydrogen, there are only two possible ways for the proton and electron to align themselves. Either their spin is aligned in opposite directions, with the proton being spin up and the electron being spin down, or vice versa, or they could be aligned with their spin in the same direction, either both down or both up. When the spin of an electron is aligned in the same direction as that of the proton, the electron has slightly more energy than it does when the spin is opposite. The difference in energy is about 5.87 microelectron volts. Of course, all matter in the universe tends to want to be in the lowest possible energy state. So this electron is always trying to give up that extra energy. This would involve the spin of the electron flipping from the spin being in the same direction to the opposite direction from that of the proton. And this is called a spin-flip transition. Because energy has to be conserved, the difference in energy between the two states is emitted from the electron as a photon. The photon emitted during the spin-flip transition has a frequency of 1.42 gigahertz and a wavelength of 21.1 centimeters. A hydrogen atom in the higher energy state will take about 10 million years before it decides to undergo the spin-flip transition. Obviously, we're not going to see this if we wait around in a laboratory looking at one individual hydrogen atom. But because there are an estimated 10 to the power of 80 atoms in the universe, and 90% of those atoms are hydrogen, hydrogen atoms in the universe are undergoing this spin-flip transition on a constant basis. Therefore, whenever you have a lot of hydrogen gathered in one place, such as in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, it will constantly be emitting a radio signal at 1.42 gigahertz. This is known in astronomy as the hydrogen line, and it allows us to map the location of hydrogen in the Milky Way. So that is our target, the 21 centimeter hydrogen line that allows us to detect the location of hydrogen particularly in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Will we be able to detect it? For that, you'll have to tune in for the next episode of Photonic. Each episode, I hope to take the opportunity to introduce people to new resources that they might not be familiar with. This week, 
I would like to point people to the Astronomical League. Most people who do astronomy already know about the Astronomical League, and if you belong to a local astronomy club, chances are you're already a member. The Astronomical League is a sort of meta-organization that pulls together information from astronomy clubs around the world. It's also a great resource for educational information. And one of their best programs is their observation programs. These are a set of projects that will walk you through getting to know a particular aspect of astronomy, whether it's exploring the night sky with binoculars for the first time or much deeper dives. In fact, it was one of these observation programs that first got me interested in radio astronomy. And the itty bitty telescope that I worked on in the video that I uploaded several months ago earned me the bronze level in the radio astronomy observational program. My hope is that this new pyramidal horn radio telescope will help me earn the silver level certificate. If you're interested in the Astronomical League, be sure to check out the link in the description below.